you're over 40, you already know it's over, man. It's like, you know, I'm losing more hair than I'm gaining. I go out in the yard and throw a baseball for five minutes, and I'm taking Advil for the next 10 days. I mean, it's just, you know, I can't see. I can't hear good. I don't remember anything anymore. And as amazing as it is, the body is starting to break down. And that's important because our human body, this amazing God miracle, is carrying something eternal. We are not just flesh and blood, you and me, but we have been made in the image of God, created in the image of the divine, and you and I have something unique in all of creation. We have a soul on the inside of us, a spiritual dimension of us made in the very image of God. And the mission is not to keep the body alive forever. That's not going to happen. The mission is that while the body is alive, that we find the answer to how to get this thing on the inside of us alive as well, so that what we're carrying that's eternal is also eternally alive. That's the message of the church. It's the message of North Point. It's the message of Christianity. It's what Jesus Christ was all about, giving inside life to people, life in the spirit that comes by faith in Jesus Christ. Christ alone. I want you to leave this morning and just celebrate. I'm alive. I want, that's good news, and I hope we all leave that way. That would be better for the service this morning if we all go out of here physically alive, um, and we just walk out the door going, I'm alive. That's a miracle. Thank you, God. The bigger miracle would be if we can walk out the door this morning and go, I am alive, but I'm also alive on the inside. I have spiritual life inside of me that's never going to die. That's what the gospel is all about. A lot of people think the church, Christianity, God, this whole thing's about being good or being bad. It's really all about being dead or being alive. You ask the average person, how do you get to heaven? Just be good. Ask, ask the average person in America, do you think you're going to heaven? They would say, yes, I think I'm going to heaven. Think is a pretty scary word, by the way, when you're talking about heaven. But they would say, I think I'm going to heaven. Well, why do you think you're going to heaven? Here's the answer for most people. Well, um, I think I've been a, fill in the blank for me, pretty good person. Now, that's not good standing for something that lasts forever. I think, now you want to use the word no there, uh, pretty good. You don't want to use pretty good there. You, you want to say in that moment something concrete, but a lot of people come back with, well, I think I've been a pretty good person, and that's what it's all about. It's about whether you're bad or whether you're good, and God's going to add it all up at the end of the day and give everybody a prize. And, you know, I'm not going to probably get, make a hundred, but I'm, you know, not going to make a zero either. And it helps sometimes just to draw that little diagram out for people and say, well, where do you think you are? I mean, if we had a diagram that said worst on one side and best on the other side, where would you put yourself? I mean, if this is what it's all about, and at the end of the day it comes down to whether you're good or bad, where would you put yourself on that diagram? Let's say we had a diagram that had worst on one end. Well, we do. Isn't that convenient? And uh, this is going to be fun. We're going to start with you, by the way. So just give you a couple seconds to think about it. Um, <laughs> I'm only kidding. Um, Worst is on one end, best is on the other. Now, you ask people, where would you go on there? Okay, you think you've been a pretty good person, like pretty good like in best, or pretty good is like in a little bit worse, better than worst. Where would you go? It helps sometimes, if you're going to have this conversation with the people, by the way, to put some other people on there first. <laughs> because it's a lot easier to judge other people than it is to judge ourselves, right? Because you have that objective vantage point. So you can put some other people on there while they think about it. For example, I like to start with Billy Graham. Um, let's put Billy Graham on there. And they're like, well, okay, well, that's not going to be too complicated, is it? I mean, Dr. Graham, of course, if you put him on there, let's see where he lands on here. Um, this is not spiritually scientific, but close. Of course, he just goes right up there to the end. Now, he, he would admit he's not perfect, but come on, he's Billy Graham, so he's going up there. So you're like, okay, that's, that's good. Um, I, I would say that. Most people will give you that one. Um, let's try another easy one. Let's do um, Andy Stanley. <laughs> there he is. That's our pastor, by the way, if you're uh, just visiting. Now, let's try him on there. I think I know where this one's going to go, too. Of course, he's going to go right, well, uh, there were those days in college, I remember. No, yeah, he's going to go down there. That's where Andy's going to live. You're like, well, wait a minute. Why didn't he go all the way down to Billy Graham? He doesn't want to go all the way down to Billy Graham. Nobody wants to go all the way down to Billy Graham. He's Billy Graham. 
But he's way down there. He's down in the best area. Let's try somebody else. This is, see, you're going to put you on here in a minute, so I'm just giving you time to think about it and some stuff to work with. Okay, you're like, oh, I'm not Billy Graham. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Let's try Simon Cowell. How many of you, have won, you want to run the joystick right now? You want to put him on there, don't you? If you don't know who Simon Cowell is, you should get out more. Um, he's one of the judges on American Idol, and he is rude and ruthless. And he likes to make people cry. And so we're going to make him cry now, okay? Um, let's try Simon Cowell. Where is he going to go on here? Yeah, that's right. He's absolutely going left. Down. Oh, we're going to come back a little bit. All right, that's good. I like that. Now, I don't know Simon Cowell, and I don't want a lawsuit, so he might be the nicest guy in the world. Might be holier than Billy Graham, for all I know. But that's just what we can see. Let's try a couple more. Um, Oprah Winfrey. Where would we put Oprah on here? Guys, come on. You're watching every day. You know Oprah better than anybody else. Oprah is a philanthropist. A hu uh, she's like a humanitarian. She's got amazing influence. She gives women free stuff every year. Oprah's favorite things. She gives cars away. You know she's going to have to, most powerful woman in television, maybe the most powerful person in television. So where's Oprah going to go? I don't know. We're going to have to find out. Oprah, Oprah's going, Andy, wow. Okay. Oh, all right, cool. I think I might put her a little closer to Andy, but hey, that's fine. Um, let's try one more. I tried to think of a bad person. I didn't really want to incriminate anyone because that's not good in front of a lot of people um, unless you want to get sued. And so, uh, but I did find Ken Lay. Do you know who Ken Lay is? Does anybody know who Ken Lay is? Some of you are like, I know Simon Cowell, but I don't know Ken Lay. Who is that? He's the head of Enron, which um, built people out of billions of dollars. People's um, 401ks were gone. Their retirements were gone. People lost their homes. The whole thing fell apart, and uh, we don't know if it's Ken Lay's fault. We're going to find that out, I guess. But um, let's put him on there because we need somebody uh, that goes down to the other end. Let's see where he lands on here. You're laughing already down there. Must have been some Enron people <laughs> down here. They're like, yeah, that's where we want to see him. Whoa, he didn't do very good, Ken Lay. All right, so we got a nice balance going here. You're like, see, you need Ken Lay. Everybody's got their own Ken Lay, by the way. Yours could be somebody, but you're always going to come up with that guy, aren't you? Or that, that, that other lady, and you're going to go, well, I'm not Ken Lay. I mean, I didn't, like, embezzle the whole company and ruin everybody's future. Okay, that's true. So where would you put you? Let's just say you're going to go on there, and you have to go somewhere. And now it's getting a little complicated, because you know you're not going that little space to the right of Billy Graham. Nobody's going in there. You're like, yeah, that little last little part down there by the arrow, I'd probably squeeze myself just right in there. Most people would do this, I think. They would get on the scale. They'd start talking about their past. They would talk about their future. They would say, well, you know, I've done some good things. Well, of course, I've also done some bad things in my life, and some really bad things, but I've also tried to, always tried to do good things, and I think if I had to go somewhere on there, I'd probably end up right about there. Just in a safe spot, isn't it? Just kind of over halfway. Not too terribly bad, not too terribly good, but about over halfway. But notice, um, as we look at this thing as a whole, I mean, it's got two problems, and here they are. Number one problem is, is that you and I are worse than we think. No matter where we go on here, we always end up worse than we think we are. For example, God gave us ten clear rules. How are you doing on those? Can you name them? No. For eternity, some people in the building. Now you're thinking, oh, of course I can. We'll try it on the way home and over lunch. No, I'm, I'm about to tell them to you so you'll know then. But if I didn't tell you and you just had to get out a pen and a piece of paper real quick and heaven was riding on it and I just said, just write down the Ten Commandments, man, there'd be some sweating going on in the building. Because you'd get five of them just that fast and then that sixth one, oh yeah. And then the seventh one would be like, yeah. And then like eight, nine, and ten, yeah, iffy. So we don't know them. How are we going to keep them? But let's see how we've done, because you probably think you've done pretty good. Have you um, ever had any other God before God? Ever had anything in your life that took the place of God in your life at any time in your life? Well, yeah. Okay, we're 0 for 1. Um, have you ever had an idol in your life besides God? A person, a thing, a job, a career, something that you, were, that you owned? Yeah. Okay, we're 0 for 2. You ever taken the Lord's name in vain? Well, I don't cuss. Well, this, they didn't, this wasn't about the GD word. This was about 
calling on God and saying that you believed in God, but not really living it as if it were true. Ever done that? Mm-hmm. Oh, for three? It's gotten awfully quiet in here. <laughs> Ever remembered the Sabbath to keep it holy? Absolutely, I'm here. Don't I get credit for being here? Yeah, have you been here every Sunday? No, of course not. Have you remembered God every Sunday? Have you remembered Sabbath every Sunday? Have you tried to keep your heart focused on the bigness of God every Sunday? You mean like every Sunday? Like when he said remember the Sabbath, he meant like every one? Yeah. No. Oh, for four. Have you lied? Six. <laughs> Have you stolen? Seven. Have you coveted from your neighbor? I actually did on the way out of the driveway this morning. <laughs> Have you honored your father and mother all the days of your life? No. <laughs> but you hadn't killed anybody. Then Jesus comes along and ruins everything. If you hate your brother in your heart, you might as well have murdered him. <sighs> well, I haven't committed adultery. I'm not even married. <laughs> have you ever looked at a man or a woman and had a sexual relationship with them in your mind? Jesus said, if you have, you've committed adultery with them. Oh, for 10. <laughs> and then James makes it worse. If you ever knew what was right to do and you didn't do it, that was sin. Just knowing what was the right thing to do and choosing not to do the right thing, not doing the wrong thing, sin. So A problem is we're a lot worse than we think. B problem is sin doesn't make you bad. Sin makes you dead. So even one sin brings death to the soul. This inside eternal thing we're carrying inside these bodies, just one sin makes us soul dead. And so the problems today are enormous. That's why the conversation isn't, if you want to go to heaven and you want to be a Christian and you want to be forgiven and you want to have eternal life, well, all you have to do is try to get yourself down to the good end of the spectrum by doing as much good stuff as you can. You can't because, A, we're a lot worse than we think we are, and, B, sin doesn't make you bad. Sin makes you dead. That's what Scripture teaches. So then Jesus didn't come to help us, you know, kind of improve ourselves so we could get to heaven. Jesus came to give life to people who had no chance for God apart from the gift that he could give them. A couple of passages of scripture I want you to see. The first one's in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1. And I want you to check out what it says here. It's pretty amazing stuff. It says, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. Now that's a whole new way of looking at it. So now it's not about, you know, I'm a little better than this person. I'm not quite as, you know, bad as that person. It's more of, have you ever committed sin in your life? Have you ever disobeyed God? Have you ever rebelled against God? If so, here's the result. As for you, Paul wrote, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. Physically dead? No. Brain still working, 100 million messages a second, computing all kinds of stuff. The eyelids are still blinking five times a second. I'm physically alive. Then what's he talking about? He's talking about our soul, spiritually, on the inside, dead. You were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world. And now he's going to describe what that life looked like. And the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work and those who are disobedient, all of us, so it's a big, huge you and me thing here, also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. In other words, God's judgment was going to fall on us because of sin, which had brought spiritual death to our soul. But the story gets really exciting right here, and this is why people jump up and down and shout and get excited about their new relationship with Christ. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ 
even when we were dead in our sins. Isn't that beautiful? In other words, Jesus Christ did not leave heaven, come to earth, live a perfect life, die on a cross for the sins of the world, be raised from the dead by the power of God just to make us better. He did not do all of that and suffer humiliation and shame on the cross just so he could push us up from a 72 to a 78. His mission was not a betterment mission. His mission was to come and pay the price in death so that he then could give the gift of life to people who had been made dormant because of sin. Who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. Now listen to a couple of other passages. For the wages of sin is death, Romans 6.23 says. Not the wages of sin is you're not good. The wages of sin is you're dead. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 3.20, therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by observing the law. Not one single person. No one. Instead, it's worse than that, through the law, we become conscious of sins. What does that mean? It just means go down the list of the ten clear things and then go, oh. <laughs> but now, a righteousness from God, apart from the law, has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify, and here it comes, this righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. So there's a whole new righteousness. There's a whole new way of coming to God, and it comes through Jesus Christ. And how does it happen? This is the miracle. It happens through spiritual birth. How'd you get alive physically? Did you try? No. I mean, were you just going one day, you know, if I just keep working harder, I'll be alive? Those little cells down there going, hey, come on, let's try to make somebody. No, there was life coming from your mom and coming from your dad, and from life came life. You didn't have anything to do with it. You were just there to observe you becoming you. I mean, it was a miracle of life happening inside of you. So how do you become alive on the inside? How do you get life in this spirit? How do you get eternal life? Exact same thing. You have to be born. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that simple? Churches are hospitals. The gospel is a maternity ward. It's not about us trying to improve ourselves to heaven. It's about being born all over again as children of God. And that's the miracle of the gospel. Listen to the way that John says it. John 1, verse 12. Yet to all who received him. Now the him here is Jesus. To all who received Jesus. To those who believed in his name. Now that's not just mental, okay, I believe in a guy named Jesus. It really is saying in the text, I accept that this Jesus Christ is Messiah, Savior of the world, sent from God. To all who received him, to those who believe in his name, the name of Jesus, he gave the right to become children of God. That's how you get in the kingdom, by the way. One man asked him late at night, how do you get into God's kingdom? How do you get into heaven? Jesus said, you got to be born again. And he looked at him and said, that's going to be complicated. And Jesus said, no, 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 no. I'm not talking about human birth. I'm talking about inside birth. I'm talking about spiritual birth. you got to be born again on the inside. He gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent. So that means your mom and dad didn't give you anything when you got born again. Oh, yeah, they did. They were right there holding my hand. Yeah, they might have encouraged you to the hospital, but in the maternity ward, they didn't have anything to do with the birth. Not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. That's the miracle. It's absolutely stunning to think of it, and the implications are staggering. I'll give you a couple. One, it's a way to God by grace through faith in Christ, not by works. Two, when you do put your faith in Christ and he does birth new life in you, you are then a son or a daughter of God, and you have brand new DNA, new genes on the inside. And where'd you get them? from God, 
who birthed the life. God, who gave you new life inside. God, who forgave you of sin. God, who brought your spirit from death to life. God did that. Where did you get this eternity that's in your hearts? It came from God, all from God. So in the spirit, in here, the inner man, the new person, God is in there. God's genes are in you. You're carrying the DNA of the creator and the universe inside of you. You are two miracles today. If you're a Christian, you're a miracle of life and the brain's doing some amazing stuff and everything else is as well, 75,000 miles worth of arteries, blood vessels, and capillaries inside of you. You're a miracle of life, and you are a double miracle of life in that you have the genetic makeup of the creator of the world birthed inside of your soul. And the last implication is pretty, pretty challenging for us. That means that the natural outcome of our life is to do what? To grow up and to look like our Father in heaven. You start looking like Larry Jr., people aren't freaked out. They go, look, of course you are. Why, why wouldn't you? You got his DNA stamped in every one of your 75 trillion cells. The way his ear does that thing, your ear does that thing. The way he laughs, you laugh. You're like, no, I'm not going to laugh like that. Yeah, you are. You're going to laugh just like that. You probably already are and don't know it. I'll never drive that slow. Oh, yeah, you will. You'll drive just like that. Your vision will go out just like his vision did. It, it, will, it will all happen. And when it happens, people don't freak out. They go, of course. That's what's the natural outcome of the genetic DNA code that's inside of you. So I ask you this. If we have been born again through Christ to new spiritual life, what should happen in you and me? We should grow up and be like God. Paul said it this way, Ephesians 5, 1, be imitators of God as dearly loved children. That's not shallow hope for mere mortals trying to do godly things. That is a confident hope that we have the DNA of God inside of us so that we can do this. What? We can look at our dad, observe what he does and who he is and what he is like, mirror and model him, and then based on the Christ life inside of us, move towards a life that looks like God him. A couple of passages I want you to see just amazing in this own thing, but listen to Romans 8, 28 and 29. We know the first part of this, but I want you to hear the back part. We know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. Now we've heard that all of our lives. For those who are called according to his purpose, but listen to what his purpose is. For those who he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, this is amazing. In order that he, his son, might be the firstborn among many brothers. In other words, he's saying, here's the plan. I put Christ's life in you. Remember, he died for the sins of the world, was the first one brought back from the dead by the power of God, but not just so that he could be raised from the dead, so that you could be raised from the dead, and 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 you and you and you and me and all of us on the inside could be raised up out of the death of sin into a brand new creation in God. And then he would be the firstborn, it says, of many brothers. In other words, he'd be the first one, and we come right behind him going, we want to share in that life. But you, Paul says in Ephesians, did not learn Christ in this way, if indeed you've heard him and been taught in him just as truth is in Jesus. That in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self. It's being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self, and check out the new self, pretty stunning, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. What is he saying? He's saying something new has been created inside of you. Something godly has birthed inside of you. You've got to set your sights way higher than you have them. It's not about being better than Ken Lay. It's not about being better than Simon Cowell or being better than Billy Graham. I'll tell you something about all the people on that diagram. Every one of them, good, bad, worst, or in the middle, including Billy and Andy, who would be the first two to tell you, were dead in sin apart from Jesus Christ. It didn't matter where we thought they landed on the scale. And Christ brought us to life. Then 
Christ wants to make us into the image of God. Am I saying this morning it doesn't matter if you're good or bad? Absolutely not. I'm just saying that's not how you get into heaven. You get into heaven by being alive. And once Christ births his new life in us, yeah, we want him to mature us into the very likeness of Jesus. And that's the goal for you. And it's the goal for me. It happens all because of the cross of Jesus Christ. I want to invite you to that cross this morning. It's stunning.